Pro and we are looking at Amazon Redshift, which is a fully managed petabyte size data warehouse. So what we use a data warehouse for, we would use it to analyze massive amounts of data via uh, complex SQL queries. Uh, Amazon Redshift is a columnar store database. So to really understand what uh, Redshift is, we need to understand what a data warehouse is. To understand what a data warehouse is, it's good to compare it against a database. And to understand um, this, we need to set some foundational knowledge and understand what a database transaction is. So let's define a database transaction. A transaction symbolizes a unit of work performed within a database management system. So an example of a transaction are reads and writes. It's as simple as that. And uh, for database and data warehouse, they're going to treat transactions differently. Uh, and so for a database, which we have an online transactional processing system, an OLTP, uh, the, uh, the transactions are going to be short. So look at the bottom here. We say short transactions. So that means small and simple queries with an emphasis on writes. Okay. So why would we want short transactions? Well, for OLTP, well, a database was built to store current transactions. It enables fast access to specific transactions for ongoing business processes. So they're just talking about, I have a web app and we need to be very responsive for the, the current user for reads and writes. Okay. And so that could be adding an item to your shopping list. That could be sign up. That could be doing any sorts of thing in a web application. And generally these are backed by a single source. So a single source would be Postgres, uh, could be running on RDS. Uh, and so that's the idea behind a database. So if we go over to the data warehouse side, it runs on an on online analytical processing system, an OLAP. And OLAPs are all about long transactions. So long and complex SQL queries with an emphasis on reads. Uh, so a data warehouse is built to store large quantities of historical data uh, and enable fast and complex complex queries across all data. So the, the utility here is business intelligence tools, generating reports. And a data warehouse isn't a single source. It is It takes data from multiple sources. So DynamoDB, EMR, S3, Postgres, all over the place. Data is coming into one place so that we can run uh, uh, complex queries and not too frequently. So now that we know what a data warehouse is, let's talk about the reasons why you'd want to use Redshift. Um, so Redshift, the pricing starts at 25 cents per hour with no upfront costs or commitments. It scales up to petabytes, uh, uh, petabytes of data for $1,000 per terabyte per year. Redshift is priced less than one-tenth the cost of most similar services. Redshift is used for business intelligence. Redshift uh, uses OLAP. Redshift is a columnar store database. And this is the second time we've mentioned this. And we really need to understand what a columnar storage database is to really understand the power behind Redshift and data warehouses. So columnar storage for database uh, is uh, database tables is an important factor in optimizing anal analytic query performance because it drastically reduces the overall disk IO requirements and reduces the amount of data you need to load from the disk. So columnar storage is the reason why uh, Redshift is so darn fast. And we're gonna look at that in more detail here. So let's really cement our knowledge with Redshift and show a use case example. So here I have, I want to build my own business intelligence tool and I have a bunch of different sources. So I have data coming from EMR, I have data coming from S3, I have data coming from DynamoDB and I'm going to copy that data. However, I, I want, there's a copy command and I'm going to copy that data into Redshift. Okay, so, but once that data is in there, you say, well, how do I interact and, and access Redshift data? Uh, normally, you know, most services you use the AWS SDK, but in this case, we're not using AWS SDK because we just may, need to make a generic SQL connection uh, to Redshift. And so if we were using Java, and generally you probably will be using Java if you're using Redshift, you'd be using J JDBC or ODBC, which are third-party libraries to connect and query Redshift data. So, uh, you know, I said columnar storage was very important to uh, Redshift's performance. And so let's conceptually understand what that means. So uh, what would we normally use with a database would be uh, reading via the rows, whereas in, in uh, uh, an OLAP, we're reading versus columns. Because if we're going to be looking at a, uh, at, at a lot of data and crunching it, we, it's better to look at it at, at columns, okay? Because that way, if we're reading columns, it allows us to uh, store that data as the same data, price for, uh, data type for allow for easy compression. That means that we're going to be able to load data a lot quicker. And because we're always looking at massive amounts of data at, at the same time, we can pull in uh, only the columns that we need in bulk, okay? And so that's going to give us 
uh, much faster performance for uh, our use case, which is like business intelligence tools. So Redshift configuration, uh, you can set it up in uh, two different cluster types. So you have single node, which is a great way to get started on uh, Redshift. If, if you don't have a lot of money, you want to play around, you can just launch a single node of 160 uh, gigabytes, or you can launch a multi-node. Uh, multi and so when you launch a multi-node, you always have a leader node, and then you have compute nodes, and you can add up to 128 compute nodes. So you have a lot of computing power behind you. Now, I just want to point out that when you do spin up uh, Redshift in multi-node, you're going to see there's a maximum set of 32. And I just said there's 128, so what's going on here? Well, it's just one of those same defaults where AWS wants to be really sure that you want more than 32, because you know if you come in day one and someone hits 128, uh, they want to make sure that they have the money to pay for it. So if you need more than 32 nodes, you just have to go ask AWS for a ser service li uh, limit increase. Now, besides there being different cluster types, there's also different node types. And so we have uh, two that are labeled here. We have DC, uh, dense compute, and dense storage, DS. Okay, and they are as what they say they are. One is optimized for computing power and one is optimized for storage. So, you know, depending on your use case, you're going to choose what type of node you want. Uh, notice that there are no smalls or micros. We all we uh, only start at large here because if you're doing Redshift, you're working with large amounts of data. So, you know, that makes total sense. Uh, compression is something uh, that is the most important thing in terms of speed. So Redshift uses multiple compression techniques to achieve uh, significant compression relative to traditional uh, relational data stores. Similar data is stored sequentially on disk. Uh, it does not require indexes or materialized views, which saves a lot of space compared to tra traditional systems. When loading data to an empty table, data is sampled, and the most appropriate compression scheme is selected automatically. So this is all great information um, for the exam. You know, it's not so important to remember this. If you know what Redshift is, is utilized for, uh, these nitty-gritties uh, for the associate is not so uh, important. Uh, Redshift processing. So Redshift uses massively parallel processing, which they acronize or initialize as MPP. It automatically distributes data and query loads across uh, all nodes and lets you easily add new nodes to your data warehouse while still maintaining fast query performance. So yeah, it's easy to add more compute power uh, uh, on demand. Okay, and so we got Redshift backups. So backups are enabled by default uh, with a one day retention period and retention periods can be modified up to 35 days. All right, uh, Redshift always attempts to maintain at least three copies of your data. One is the original copy. Uh, the second is a replica on the compute nodes. And then the third is a backup copy in S3. Uh, and so Redshift also can asynchronously replicate your snapshots to uh, S3 in a different region. So, you know, if you need to move your data region per region, uh, you have that option as well. For Redshift billing, uh, the compute node hours, the total number of hours ran across all nodes in the billing period. Build one unit per node per hour, and you're not charged for the leader nodes per hour. So when you spin up a, uh, a cluster and you only have one compute node and one, one uh, leader node, you're just paying for the compute node. Um, for backups, backups are stored on S3 and you're billed the S3 storage fees, right? So, you know, just same, same thing as, as usual. And data data transfer build only only transfers within a VPC, not outside up outside of it. Okay, uh, Redshift security. So we have data in transit. So you can encrypt using SSL. Data rest. So we can encrypt using AES two five six encryption. Database encryption can be applied using uh, KMS, or you can use Cloud HSM. And here you can see it's just as easy as applying it. Uh, Redshift availability. So Redshift is single AZ. Super important to remember this because a lot of services uh, are multi-AZ, but Redshift is not one of them, maybe in the future, but maybe not. Um, to run in multi-AZ, you would have to run multiple Redshift clusters in a different AZ with, with same inputs. So you're basically just running a clone and it's all manual labor, right? So there's no managed automatic way of doing multi-AZ. Snapshots can be restored to a different AZ in the event of an, uh, an outage occurs. And just to wrap everything up, 
We have a really good uh, Redshift cheat sheet here. Definitely recommend you print this out for your exam. And we're going to go through everything again. So data can be loaded from S3 EMR, DynamoDB, or multiple data sources on remote hosts. Redshift is Colomer's, uh, Colomer's store database, uh, which can give you SQL-like queries and is, and is an OLAP. Redshift can handle petabytes worth of data. Redshift is for data warehousing. Redshift's most common use case is business intelligence. Redshift can only run in one AZ, so it's a sing it's single AZ, it's not multi-AZ. Redshift can run via a single node or multi-node for clusters. A single node is 160 uh, gigabytes in size. A multi-node is comp uh, comprised of a leader node and multiple compute nodes. You are billed per hour for each node, excluding the leader node in multi-node. You are not billed for the leader node. Just repeating that again there. You can have up to 128 compute nodes. And again, I said earlier that the maximum uh, by default was 32, but they're not going to ask you what the, the default is. Uh, Redshift has two kinds of node types, dense compute and dense storage. And it should be pretty obvious uh, when you should use one or the other. Redshift attempts to back, uh, uh, back up your data three times, the original on the compute node and on S3. Similar data is stored on a disk sequentially for faster reads. Redshift data, uh, database can be encrypted via KMS or Cloud HSM. Backup retention is default to one day and can be increased uh, to a maximum of 35 days. Uh, Redshift can asynchronously back up to your snap uh, to your uh, backup via snapshot to another region delivered uh, via S3. And Redshift uses massively parallel processing to distribute queries and data across all loads. And in the case of an empty empty table, when importing uh, Redshift, will sample the data to create a a schema. So there you go. That's Redshift in a nutshell, uh, and that should help you uh, for the exams.